I'm David, uh, here with my partner, Julie, from uh, Berkeley, California. And I've been organizing since I was in high school and a lot in the last couple decades uh, as an organizer turning to art, theater, culture as a tool to be more strategic and effective. And the last three months started working part-time with uh, 350 to try and bring art and culture into the heart of the climate justice movement and of 350. One thing I love about it is that uh, this, the, the fossil fuel system and the economic system behind it has created a crisis that as organizers it gives us I think the best opportunity of our life to connect movements and build a movement of movements which we have to do to, to overthrow the folks who have made uh, a mess of the world so I'm actually super excited to do that and I got to do a little bit of art in Toronto uh, I don't know if people caught it I think a week ago Sunday they had a mass march that was kind of amazing in that it, to me it showed the kind of movement we have to build and that they even got the labor unions of workers who work on tar sands in the streets together with climate justice activists, together with anti-poverty, First Nations, uh, all kinds of uh, community organizing and all in the streets together. So we have to out-organize our opponents because they'll try and divide us and peel people off. So we have to figure out how do we organize a movement of movements to, to change everything. And, and I like Naomi Klein's analysis that it's not really about a competition between different issues that, you know, climate change is one lens that is actually a multiplier that can actually, should actually, can and should throw weight behind all our movements. And, you know, those of us who are focused primarily on climate change, we have to uh, figure out how we can help multiply uh, workers' struggles, healthcare struggles, and vice versa, I hope. Anyway, um, I'm going to ask you to do one thing, which is uh, ignore me struggling with technology. There's some... There's, there's an invisible portal to another world in which this is taking place, so I'm just gonna, gonna try and figure this out. Yeah? Okay, I, I, I'm good. Let's see. So somehow. So I have to drag, drag the stuff into the portal, into the other world, and then look up at, on the screen. So just pretend that's not happening. That's why I like fabric and wood and duct tape. I've worked as a carpenter most of my life, so I'm very familiar with that technology. I often call this uh, disempower point. <laughs> so I'm here to issue a call to arts. So actually, arts organizing, but this is uh, 350 is the first uh, nonprofit type group I know that's actually had a position on arts organizing. And so I was already about 20 years ago, I, I started to pursue artists and performers and recruit them to help uh, shape our demonstrations and campaigns. And then at a certain point, it's like, okay, I'm going to all the meetings, do all the organizing. And my friends, the artists and performers, are getting to do all the art culture. It's like, hey, I want to do that part too. So I started to shift over. But, uh, but when I started with 350, we, uh, we articulated the primary goal of the arts organizing campaign, and that's it, to massively utilize arts organizing and integrate it into the heart of our North American organizing campaigns, mobilizations to strengthen movement building, innovate new forms of resistance, and win positive change. And so I see that as you know, throwing down for 350, but also trying to uh, do what I can for all the movements. Julie and I were just... Uh, on a couple days ago, we were doing a big art build with Idle No More in the Bay Area, who yesterday marched against crude by rail. So I'm hoping we can build this up amongst all the different movements. So I'm going to uh, show a bunch of images and tell some stories for a little bit, and then see if I can get you on your feet and do a, a, an instant theater game. And uh, then uh, we're going to talk about next steps and uh, what we can do. Is it possible to dim the lights a little bit? A little bit about the reason to call the art. One is to win the battle of the story. That uh, I have some good friends with the Center for Story-Based Strategy, but a lot of us believe that the core uh, struggle to change the world is a struggle over different stories. And whether we win or lose depends on how effective we are as, as storytellers 
and also analyzing our opponent's story. So I'm always uh, harassing my friends who have skills in art and theater and music and culture because those are, uh, you know, if we're on a battlefield, those are the sharpest swords in the battle of the story. So we actually need those folks not just to show up the day before the rally and sing a folk song or decorate, but actually to, to think on the ground floor as we create our campaigns and movements. How, what's our story? How are we going to tell it? What's our opponent's story? How are we going to tear it apart and win? So that's one reason. The other is to grow mass movements. Uh, my experience with uh, collectively creating different forms of arts and having movements and public events and actions and popular education that are artful uh, is that the process of making it is a great way to involve people. There's a lot of us who will come to your art build or your theater practice or your marching band that probably won't come to your planning subcommittee meeting. So I think, and a lot of, you know, so I think it's, it's a huge way to grow the movement. And I, my experience is that people are really drawn towards movements, whether it's the singing of the civil rights movement or the visual arts of some of our marches or something like that. So growing the movement, shifting the culture, uh, I was just reading a wonderful piece by Faviana Rodriguez, who I get to collaborate with, who's with a group called Culture Strike. And she and Jeff Chang, who wrote, uh, writes a lot on hip hop, they write about how uh, sort of transforming, making change in the society, it's kind of like a wave. And usually the, the policy change or the mass mobilization is sort of where the wave crashes. But if you ever look at the ocean, there's all this sort of underneath swelling up of the water. And a lot of that is about uh, cultural change that precedes uh, the political change. And so a lot of folks who work in areas of culture are, are most uh, in the best place to shift our attitudes, our narratives, our associations with different things. So it's, it's recognizing that shifting the culture is essential to shifting the, the political change. Um, for nurture innovation, uh, there's a great book that came out a couple years ago by Erica Chenoweth called uh, How Civil Resistance Works. And she was sort of a skeptic about nonviolent direct action. And so she said, well, you know, to really figure out what works, you'd have to study all the mass movements for the last century. And she did that. And she took away a bunch of conclusions and tried to figure out which movements, uh, well, she looked at which movements were successful and which ones weren't and what what the lessons were about that. And one, of the, one key lesson that she pulled out is that movements that had the capacity to innovate, not do the same thing over and over, but sort of like a creative chess player, constantly shift and not get stuck in old patterns, that those ones were much more successful. So I guess I, I, I believe uh, a lot of the creative processes lead us to innovate. Although I think as with culture, we can also get stuck in doing the same thing over and over again. Um, because they are, and with that, they don't call it arts organizing, but uh, elites keep us down and hold their power essentially through similar things, through using narrative, advertising, propaganda. Edward Bernays, uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, uh, in the early part of the century, he, he joined the US government as part of their public relations team to sell the first uh, world war to the American people. And he developed the, a lot of the theory of modern advertising that's still used today, whether it's recruiting people for a war or persuading you uh, that we, we need fossil fuel. And he said that, uh, rough quote, but something to the effect of uh, through modern public relations and propaganda, we can control the, the group mind without their knowing it. And so basically, in a lot of the ways we're controlled are through stories and the fossil fuel industry in particular is very fervent about, you know, we, there's a great story that just came out about how they funded the narrative that climate change is uh, not real. And even though, uh, I don't know if people saw that, but even though they knew it was real, they funded just like the tobacco industry did for so long, funded the, the propaganda that uh, smoking is not bad for your health. So. We actually have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on full-time campaigns to try and counter our narratives. So we actually have to think of ourselves as an art army and fight on really big scales and be, I mean, I always try and push people also on 
art is not a cute fluffy thing. It's a life and death struggle and you know, we have to be smart and strategic. It's also fun and vibrant and beautiful, but also uh, I think we have to, people who are telling stories, we have to outsmart uh, the propagandists, the full-time public relations companies hired by our opponents and we have to create a culture strategy. So as we're painting the beautiful thing or creating the dance, we also have to think, okay, how are we gonna do a winning narrative and build that movement of movements? It's the last ones. To be unstoppable, and that just means uh, uh, to give spirit to movements, you know, and keep us hopeful. I'm, I'm 51, I've been organizing since I was 16 in high school, and a lot of what's kept, kept me uh, happy in the last couple decades is making stuff with my hands with people and I think a movement that does that a lot is uh, sustainable uh, and to tell the future I think also uh, uh, Ursula Gwynn has a great quote in her same same uh, book awards thing but that we art and culture are ways of sort of looking at the future and looking at uh, potential futures and telling them and getting people used to the idea that, that uh, those are winnable, doable, and livable. So that's my, my call to art. So let's, so I'm gonna share a bunch of stories. As I, when I was drawn to arts, a lot of that was in uh, the middle 1990s and uh, I was involved in the corporate globalization movement, which was really initiated in a lot of ways by the Zapatistas, in that uh, they were the first ones who took action around uh, corporate globalization. When North American Free Trade Agreement went into uh, effect, they had a popular rebellion across Chiapas. And they didn't just have a rebellion, but they transformed a lot of the way we struggle and resist and that inspired a lot of us. So I became part of a collective called Art and Revolution that was trying to figure out how we do cross trainings and get 100 people together, 50 of them activist organizers. We teach them how to make dances and puppets and art and theater. And then 50 of them loosely would be uh, artists and performers. And we teach them how to do a blockade, do a press release, run a meeting, that kind of stuff. So the, our thought was to try and put art and culture into movements. And the, the place that uh, the place that this would probably happen most effectively was around the Seattle WTO protests. And I like to brag that it was actually a network of street theater collectives up and down the West Coast who initiated the call to shut down the WTO and the, the organizing body, the Direct Action Network. And we called not just for direct action shutdown of the WTO, but for massive uh, art and street theater. And I, I I brag having been uh, a part of uh, a network of hundreds of folks who carried it out, but without having put art and theater at the center of that movement, the, what intended to be the most powerful institution on planet Earth, the World Trade Organization, or WTO, was the plan of the 1%, the very rich on the planet, about how to concentrate their power and wealth and create a body that would uh, be above all other uh, local, state and national bodies and so that uh, corporations and through so-called free trade could overrule any decision people made to protect themselves and their rights. So, you know, tens of thousands of people got together in Seattle and scuttled their plan A of how they're going to run the world and that was a lot through the art and culture at the center of it. We had 10 days in the lead up. We had uh, an arts build going on about 16 hours a day. And we did a, a street theater tour. My arts collective put together a street theater that had music and dance and puppets. And two folks who were impacted by the WTO, uh, Chiabad, who was a former sweatshop worker from Saipan, who tried to organize a union and had her life threatened, had to leave. And David Reed, who was a locked out steel worker from Spokane, Washington. They participated in the street theater and also sort of wove in their own personal stories. And we went all up and down the Western United States and explained corporate globalization to people, which, you know, at that point, uh, people in the U.S. were uh, not so aware of it. And it's hard to not talk about it without sounding like an economics lecture. So, and these are what the streets of Seattle look like. We actually called not just for a shutdown, but for a festival of resistance. 
and wanted to try and create, sort of inspired by the Zapatistas, but create a, a new forms of resistance and a new way to organize. And the interesting thing, I'm not quite sure what to do this, but you know, we talk about arts and theater and music and dance, but at the core, whether you're in church uh, having a ceremony, whether you're performing a theater piece or whether you're doing a demonstration, Actually, it's all the same thing. It's trying to shift consciousness, make change, assert power through, the, through your voice, your body, and the things you can make with your hands. So even though there's no art here, this is also very much theater. And this is people surrounding the WTO and keeping the delegates out and are able to shut it down for the entire first day. And something kind of magical happened, which I think the art played into, which is, uh, you know, we probably had a couple thousand, couple thousand people who were pre-organized into affinity groups and they were ready to link arms and put lock boxes on and try and shut it down. And it wasn't quite enough people to actually win the day. But something magical happened that we had done enough education. The, the spirit of the art in the streets was such and there, that uh, ordinary people who had never had any connection to any organization came and joined up and linked arms and helped shut it down. So it, it transformed from an organized resistance into a popular public uprising. So, which is, I always think that's kind of what we need to do as a movement. I love this picture of the delegates trying to scurry through our blockade lines. And they had their theater. This was a, a woman, I'm blanking her name, does anyone know? Uh, she's, she's from New England, but she wasn't at the WTO, but she was listening to it blow by blow on the radio. And she was inspired to make this woodcut was just listening to the stories of people rising up. So, well, we are shutting down the WTO in Seattle. There's a group of farm workers in South Florida centered in a town called Immokalee, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, and they were actually uh, having a general strike. I've gotten to work with them a little bit, supporting them on art stuff for the last 15 years. And I would say uh, my experience when I first uh, went to Florida, they're, they're probably the worst treated workers in the United States. Uh, about 50 bucks a day for working, sometimes a 12 hour day in Florida heat. Uh, a lot of uh, wide range of abuse and over 1500 documented cases of actual slavery. And so they had done a series of general strikes where no one worked in the fields, you know, for days at a time. And they had stopped some of the, the beatings by growers, but they were unable to increase their wages or get the growers to negotiate with them. So they, figured, they decided to make their campaign go national and to not just go after the growers, but grow out, go after the, company, the big corporations that bought the tomatoes, these, mostly tomato picking, that bought the tomatoes from the, the growers that they worked for. So using art and theater, and these are uh, mostly immigrant workers from uh, mostly Mexico, initially a lot from Haiti, and a lot of their organizing is informed by Haitian peasant organizing. You know, and these are the smartest rebels in the Western Hemisphere, the first successful slave rebellion in the Western Hemisphere. So brilliant organizers and instinctively through their popular education stuff are, understand that art and culture need to be central and so I was impressed at that point because they were like, hey, we want to fly out to Florida and get you to help us think of some stuff we can make for our cross-country caravan. So they've, they've done a huge amount of art and street theater and use it for popular education, not just for their public actions. And uh, it's been pretty amazing for me to watch uh, a group of low-wage migrant farm workers take on the largest fast food restaurants. It started with Taco Bell and grocery uh, corporations and systematically win. They've won about 15 major corporate campaigns. So I always tell people, okay, if a bunch of low-wage migrant farm workers in South Florida can take on the world's biggest corporations and kick their asses, surely we can, we can do that with fossil fuel corporations, right? Uh, I'll just jump into some techniques. This is sculpting sand and then covering it with plastic, paper mache it to make, uh, they did a 200 mile march from their farm worker area to the uh, cap the headquarters of Publix supermarket and they wanted an image to go at the beginning so we sculpted that thing in sand, covered it with plastic and then did massive paper mache and it's a great technique because anyone can sculpt sand, it's a lot less daunting than clay and so the farm workers, you know, I, I helped on technical stuff but sculpted it themselves. 
and there it is getting ready to march along with all the flags. And there it is on their 200 mile walk. But each, each spring they do a big, big mobilization. The other thing they've done is they've sort of become a university of organizing. Uh, the Student Farm Worker Alliance has thrown down hard in support of them. And so I've learned more from them than any other movement in the last 15 years. So that people just by watching them organize and building a base, making decisions democratically, and being super smart and strategic in how they fight is amazing. This was uh, one of their mobilizations where they actually uh, uh, decided, we decided to not have a rally, but have a pageant. So the whole rally was sort of a big theater piece and people from different communities like faith and students would come up and speak. And those puppets in the back, they're two-sided. So the back side of them was the atrocities of the bad conditions in the fields and each community would come up, say their piece, and then the, the puppet would rotate and become uh, what they wanted instead of the bad thing. This was this spring. They asked me to come out and they're like, because I, I work as a carpenter, they're like, David, we need you. We want to do a parade. And I'm like, oh, so we'll make little things and put wheels on them and push them. Like, they're like, no, no, no. We're going to, we want big trailers that we're going to haul with trucks. Mm -hmm. so we, we did like three giant trailers like that and uh, Mark paraded through St. Petersburg. That was, uh, and two times I've had the problem with them where uh, we've made a bunch of protest art, once against McDonald's and once against Taco Bell, and we had all this great art that we were going to protest them. And the night before, in both cases, the companies agreed to every single one of their demands. So <laughs> we had to quickly transform to a celebration. So a lot of the yellow stuff, we just stayed up all night and painted everything yellow and wrote victory on everything. <laughs> That's a good high class art problem. And this is a, they did a 200 mile march across Florida and they uh, created a, a silent street theater about how uh, farm worker rights are stuck in the mud like a truck. And it was actually kind of funny because we did a rally in this muddy grassy area and we kept getting our vehicles stuck in the mud. So this narrative of, uh, so this is a, a theater about uh, sort of the history of their struggle. This is a Freedom Now Singers out of Atlanta that was did a song at the rally. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy. Turn me round, gonna keep on walking, yeah. keep on talking, yeah. marching up to freedom. One last piece about uh, the theater pageant we did at uh, the public's headquarters.
Would you be willing to turn the lights on? My friend Mona Caron is a community muralist from the Bay Area that I collaborate with a lot. And so you'll see a lot of her work. And we were invited to uh, Cochabamba, Bolivia, for the 10 year anniversary of the water war, which our friends fighting around water. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I find it super, ins super inspiring. And so we, we met with water committees, which are committees in the poor neighborhoods where people have to self-organize their water system, like dig the trenches, run the pipe, figure out a lot of them are in the zone of sort of the high areas. So there, there's all these like brilliant DIY technology where they like hook up V8 engines to pump the water up hills and stuff like that. So for the 10 year anniversary, they had a big fair where they highlighted all their technology and all their accomplishments and we had a big <coughs> march. So we went around to the water committees in different communities and, and made art with them. And, uh, and I'm convinced that the Bolivian social movements are the sm smartest, most sophisticated, most radical movements on the planet. But we were able to do a few things about how to make some things with cardboard boxes they hadn't done before. So that was our contribution. So, and this is, uh, you know, even if you don't read Spanish, you can sort of tell what it's about. So that's a lot. What I think about is, you know, I, I am partly of the opinion that there should never be a rectangular protest sign again. It's like, what are you protesting? What's the image? You know, a four-year-old should be able to get it without having to read your slogan. We did a series of puppets. That's uh, press conference right before the march. And this was a, a workshop we did in one of the outlying communities. It's, uh, we just used garden mud to sculpt the face with the kids, which was like, this is art kids. <laughs> We're playing in that. And then covered in a, a plastic trash bag and uh, used uh, cardboard paper mache where you, you soak cardboard boxes overnight, take all the tape off, and they separate. And then you can use it. And so one layer of cardboard paper mache is worth about four layers of newspaper so you can get, especially when you start going big, you want it to be really sturdy. So it's a, a way of making really big things fast. And we, we brainstormed with the folks organizing the march. It's like, okay, let's have a central image to lead the march. And so it's like, okay, it's about water, so let's have a water drop. And then uh, Mona put, we put a face on it. So we just laid plastic out. And then we sculpted it in sand. And we covered it in plastic and then cardboard macheed the whole face. So it's like 14 feet high, pretty big. Reinforced the back, painted it. You can see some of the other puppets there. That was the march. And that was the newspaper the next day. All right, we're going to talk about sunflowers for a minute. Let's see if I can get this. So did folks see the sunflowers at the People's Climate March? You got to be in the front of the march. View slideshow. So uh, sunflowers are pretty amazing and one of the reasons I think, uh, I think the use of sunflowers, it's been used by different movements in the past, but in Detroit during the U.S. Social Forum, uh, when was that, in 2010, 2011, someone help me? But uh, I, I was invited to work with a local coalition of environmental justice groups in Detroit that are fighting a big toxic incinerator, and they were advocating to, to recycle a lot of the materials which would create jobs and stop the horrible uh, toxic pollution and greenhouse gas pollution. So we decided to do a, they decided to do a march, and so we did a brainstorm about how, and also how could we make it positive, because the neighborhood where the incinerator is, is is pretty beaten down, and they wanted some beautiful stuff. And they, 
a lot of community gardens in Detroit grow sunflowers. So chose that as a symbol. One of the things about sunflowers, you can read about it in the Farmer's Almanac, but they actually take heavy metals and certain toxins out of soil. So it was, became a, a great symbol. They also follow the sun and they're kind of like the sun, the source of food. Uh, so Detroit was the first place where we started making a bunch of big sunflowers. And, and that's actually that the stretch canvas was an, is sort of a, a flower pot. We, we planted a giant sunflower inside each one of those and we went to different communities and said, hey, what's the alternative to incineration in your community? So you can see on, on that side, there's the clean air lung and that one's the toxic, dirty air lung. And those are kids from a local church who painted those. So when we march through Detroit, you can actually see the incinerator in the background. The march was like a, a field of uh, sunflowers and became sort of uh, one of the iconic images of the social forum. We made our own uh, incinerator with the words about what it represented. So uh, I live in the Bay Area, and people know the Bay Area for a lot of things, but most people don't know that we have uh, five uh, oil refineries there, and they're the biggest greenhouse. I think two or three of them are the amongst the top ten greenhouse uh, gas polluters in the state. And in places like Richmond, our uh, local kids have double the asthma rates as the rest of the county. So, uh, and. What was it three years ago? Uh, on August 6th, there was an exp the refinery in Richmond, California, blew up and spewed out toxic fumes, and 1,500 local residents went to the hospital for respiratory and other problems. So, on the one year anniversary, uh, 350 Bay Area and all the environmental justice groups, APEN, CBE, RPA, in Richmond did a mass march. And, uh, and at actually sort of independently at the suggestion of one of the youth from the uh, urban tilth uh, adopted the sunflower as a, a core symbol of that. And that's my pickup truck with all the sunflowers the day of the demonstration that Julie and I and some friends got. And this is actually the end of the demonstration. It's, uh, we marched on the refinery, 3,000 strong, and 200 people sat down at the, and uh, occupied the main entrance of the uh, Chevron oil refinery and something pretty amazing about 3,000 people marching on a refinery and we had what, we got like 1,500 sunflowers so every other person was carrying a giant live sunflower which was you know pretty powerful so that was what the march looked like that was our poster for the march and then we also did a, a thing we've done a few times in the Bay Area where we did a street mural. This is direct, directly in front of the main entrance to Chevron and we took kids uh, washable tempera paints. Julie, Julie <laughs> led that with her daughters. Uh, and I, two, some of the reasons for tempera paint is so that if you have to negotiate with the cops you can say hey it's washable children's paint. It'll come, come right off. And also, if your friends have nice shoes and clothes, you can say, <laughs> it's washable children's paint. It'll come right off because it's messy. But we just immediately when the march arrived there, people already had a plan of what the image was. They chalked it out, passed out like 50 or how many, a bunch of containers of paint. And people, you know, here's a yellow. Can you fill in over there? And people love doing that. And there's also this thing. I mean, it, it, it's very important on your local police force and dynamics. We've done it a lot in San Francisco. But uh, once you get 25 people painting and kids painting and stuff like that, it just becomes sort of a normalized thing. So, so we did that, and that's actually, uh, that banner is all Richmond residents who are about to march across the Sunflower into the refinery and get arrested in civil disobedience. So now we're moving to... Sunset Park in Brooklyn uprose a community, an environmental justice group in Brooklyn. Uh, they played a, a big role in mobilizing around the People's Climate March. Uh, they're part of a coalition of EJ groups, environmental justice groups there. And so they, they decided, they were inspired by Detroit and Richmond, that they wanted to make lots of sunflowers. So we did cardboard ones and we also uh, 
for the first time, silk screened them on fabric with a little black outline, and that was great for an art party because people, whatever, they could just fill in, or if they wanted to be, they could paint stuff around it, add their own words. And so I'm sort of highlighting with this in the next one the idea that art, it's not just the thing that you decorate a demonstration, but the whole process of it, process of it can back up your organizing and your education. They held a street party in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, closed down the street, had music, food, and invited neighbors to come and paint flags. And hey, do you want to come and join the march and carry the flag you just painted? So. Also decided to paint a, uh, a giant parachute like a sunflower. And we did actually, we caught the typo and scrubbed it clean and rewrote it. <laughs> my, my language friends always like, it's misspelled, which is a lesson about. And this was a, a photograph the day after the march in the New York Times. with all their signs right before the march. And that was uh, a lot of uh, youth from environmental justice groups in New York City leading the march. And then moving on, uh, I got to support groups in uh, Saint Paul, Minneapolis, St. Paul. They just did a tar sands resistance march about a month ago. And uh, they also, uh, their, their resistance to tar sands is a lot because the pipelines would go through the Great Lakes regions and some of the places it would go through are farmlands where they grow huge amounts of sunflowers. So they adopted that symbol too. And you can see we did a 50 foot banner with a, a giant pipeline on it in the back. And that was what the sunflower part of their march looked like. And we painted the, the banner like a river. This was a, a photo from the local newspaper, and I guess that, I, I thought that was a positive sign that a lot of the media did long segments on video and had photo essays on the march because there was a lot to take pictures of. Are we good? Read it. Flood Wall Street. What's the other part say? Capitalism equals climate chaos. There's a, a big parachute we have a picture of there. So it, it was actually a fun thing having that. It was a 300 foot banner. We had ordered a 300 feet of muslin from a, a, a fabric place in South Carolina. And so we were like, wow, it'd be cool to use the whole roll. So we asked all the organizers, like, hey, if we try and paint a 300 by 10 foot banner, do you think you can get a bunch of people to come help out? And they're like, sure. So, so we actually, we, we did the People's Climate March with the whole length, but we, did, we thought it would be too chaotic on Wall Street. And I don't know if you can see, but right, right there is the Wall Street Bowl. So people surrounded the bowl and did uh, an all day sit in. And there was no one actually really coordinating the banner. It just sort of took on a life of its own and got passed around and shaded. And, 
So it's kind of magical. This was a, I worked a lot on art for uh, Flood Wall Street. This was a Seth to Bachman. He does a lot of housing organizing and art in New York. But I love this in that it graphically talks about how Wall Street creates climate chaos and how we're going to flood them. They're uh, dandelion seeds. And this is the design of the parachute that you could see in the, on Wall Street. Mona Caron did. It's another parachute that uh, Climate Justice Alliance did. And Idle No More and Indigenous Environmental Network did that. That's Penny and Allison from our local Idle No More who miraculously showed up on the roof in Bushwick to help paint the moment we started. That was a very nice art space. Another Seth. Last uh, February, we had a big march in Oakland with uh, 8,000 folks around fracking for oil in California. And uh, I got to help work on art stuff for it. So Julie and I designed a, a, a project called Pieces of the Solution. Stop. And. Uh, the basic idea was to ask people to make an image or write words that are, what's the solution to climate change and fracking? And that uh, we, were, we have a drought there, and so fracking both uses ridiculous amounts of water to create fossil fuels that we need to get off of, and it also is uh, contaminating most of our groundwater sources. So it's a bad idea, and our uh, self-identified environmentalist governor won't stand up to big oil on it. So we are trying to pressure him. So I don't know if you can see the, the one on the left, we, we came up with the idea and then Julie actually prototyped it with her seventh graders uh, on that one. And the idea was basically, we we're gonna make a lot of the signs for the demonstration in the shape of puzzle pieces. So if you're an artist and you wanna paint a big one, we'll, you can paint a giant solution, but the, we pass out the small ones and people could, it's a lot less daunting. You could, uh, you could just uh, draw or write words on a small one. So we did a, a little how-to thing, put it up on the website, got it. So schools all over, in a bunch of different parts of California, people who had connections with schools or were teachers were able to take the project. It was sort of uh, written up a little bit as curriculum and with a little, all the how-tos and what the size of the signs are and cutting out the stuff. But so I guess I, I, I look to art projects as how can you engage a lot of different levels. You know, we had art parties every weekend in Oakland in the lead up and if people were up for it, it's like, here's a puzzle piece, do you want to paint a big one? Or here's a small one, just do what you think. Getting people to think about solutions. And then we said, uh, even if you can't come to the demonstration, if you make one, or we had some from the, some of the schools in, uh, in Central Valley, some of the areas impacted by fracking. So the kids did art, and they weren't able to make it to the demonstration, but their images made it, which was powerful. And also just when you are drawing something on paper to know that this is going to be in the streets. And this was actually in front of our state capitol. We held a press conference announcing the march, and that was the primary visual was all the pieces of the solution. We painted, painted the words big just in case the governor didn't, couldn't read the pictures. And also integrated that image on the front banner for the march. And that, so that was what the march looked like. And you can, you can kind of see a lot of the big puzzle pieces along with other visuals. And then, so we said we'd, we'd march with them and then we'd give them to the governor so this is a, a delegation of uh, environmental and climate justice uh, organizers delivering it to the governor's office. They wouldn't, they, they didn't want to have us bring it into his actual office, so they said bring it to the mailroom. 
So, and I'm just going to show off one other project we did for that march is that Faviano Rodriguez is an uh, amazing local artist who's been engaging a lot around climate and immigration. And so she did a poster for the march that looked like that. And so I was like, let's make it big, Faviana. So we actually did an art party, painted that giant thing. It's rigged on bamboo. And we actually had it floating in, that's Lake Merritt in Oakland. It was floating on inner tubes, so just laying there. And as one of the culture strike uh, spoken word performers did a piece breaking down the impacts of fracking on our communities, we slowly had it rising out of the lake. And then it became the backdrop for the stage. So that was a, a fun way to take some art an artist had did and, and amplify it and turn it into performance. So uh, I guess I just wanted to add one comment. I don't know where people are at, but uh, I think with organizing that, we can't leave it to professional organizers or staff people that we actually need a movement where ordinary people are leaders and uh, step up. And so I think that's a, I think similarly with art and culture, it's like we love our artists and performers, but anybody can make art. A lot of the stuff that I do, I try and choose things that, that anyone can make, you know. So for those who aren't self-identified as artists or performers, go for it. Um, and if you sign Lee's list, I'll also send a, a resource book of a bunch of the best how-tos that I've found. And if you keep in touch through uh, 350, we're trying to put together a little bit of an arts organizing kit. But there's a bunch of stuff out there, and there's a bunch of skilled people in this circle. If it's OK, I was going to do a, a, an instant theater game. So let's say there's a demonstration in 15 minutes, and we really are passionate about the issue we're there for, and we want to come up with something creative that we hope will get on the news, make beautiful photographs, be more engaging than you know, uh, milling around as a group. Uh, so what's an issue people are, are feeling particularly passionate about today? That something that people, people in the circle might be somewhat familiar with. And you're going to do some kind of a physical gesture. You can add words or sounds to it if you want about, uh, you know, just wrap your head around climate change is causing ocean acidification, just, you know, all the things he said. So you're going to start us off with some kind of a physical gesture. And we're looking to communicate with people who are maybe walking by or see it on TV or, uh, you know, and so you're going to do it and we're all going to repeat it so you don't feel alone. Climate change is hurting the oceans. Mm -hmm. oh, everybody. Climate change is hurting the oceans. Everybody. Clams are losing their shells. We're melting. We're melting. Any words? No words? Anything? Okay. Let's organize. Let's organize. <laughs> and we will all rise like the water. <laughs> and we will all rise like the water. Which, so we're trying to communicate with folks who may not be aware of this issue. Let's pick three of them that are powerful and provocative. What's, what, what jumps out? What, what, which ones do people like? You go, you go. Crawling for lobsters? No lobsters. Fishing for cod? No cod. So all together now. Fishing for clams? No clams. Crawling for Lobsters, no lobsters. Fishing for cod, no cod. Okay, we got that piece. And then, so then we'll, then we'll clap three times all together. And then you do it and then we'll repeat it. 
Who feels like it? Dogs are dying. And now we're going to do one, two, three. And people will rise like the water. People will rise like the water. One, two, three. Let's organize. Let's organize. So let's put it all together and let's actually, let's all face that way because we're performing for not just ourselves. So let's actually form maybe like three lines so people have enough space to die and do all the things we need to do. Does everyone have space? Let's get our, our tree up front here. Does everyone have enough space? So we're going to take a, a deep breath together, then clap three times, do the three, and then just do it. So deep breath. Digging for clams. clams. No, no clams. clams. Digging for oil, sir. No, no lobsters. Fishing, Fishing for, for cod. cod. No, no cod. <laughs> and the people rise, rise like the water. Let's organize. <laughs> One thing I like about that especially with activists and political people, is that you get to create things without having a meeting or talking, because we're really good at, that's actually a big challenge for doing arts workshops for me, is, is like smart political people, they'll sit down and figure out their analysis and all that, and so it's fun to get a different mode. And you can actually just, that was a participatory process, we came up with it, images, put it together, and you could actually do it uh, in five minutes. So. People be willing to do one more like that. Toxins everywhere. Stop fossil fuels. Trust the tide of people power. my eight friends who did that exercise actually ended up on the nightly news and getting huge amounts of coverage and uh, you know the traditional anti-war group with their rectangular signs with 200 people got almost no coverage just because it was something different. So continuing our call to arts, how are we going to build a revolutionary art movement and transform Maine, which will then spread like dominoes across the world. There's no reason in the world. These all have sort of common threads. And that old environmental maxim of Barry Commoner going back to the 1960s, everything is connected to everything else. Uh, I could see us having 
a big rally. It's only been the beginnings of talk that serves so far, so nothing is scheduled, but something in the fall where there's a coalition of groups coming around some central themes with many, many, many people. Portland had one of bigger than at any time in its history for climate action two years ago in January, bitter cold. But it was big. And something like this that could in turn serve to launch, we don't know what yet, and all of us are you know, invited to create that. Uh, the, the organizing group that organized the uh, People's Climate March has continued meeting and they're calling for a day of action on a Wednesday in October. I know 350 and a lot of other international groups are hoping to do stuff, uh, some coordinated teachings in the fall, but also uh, around the beginning of the Paris COP climate summit, uh, there's going to be a massive march in Paris on November 30th, I think and then a mass civil disobedience in Paris on December 12th. So people are talking about doing simultaneous action so that we assert, we force the, the folks to do the right thing and show resistance if they don't. So those, those are some, some things coming up. The second, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, that Greater Portland for the last uh, couple of months really is involved in a summer campaign, which will probably extend out into the fall. Uh, we call the, the Save Our Seas, the SOS campaign. And it's really trying to raise awareness of the effects of uh, the fossil fuel uh, industry's carbon pollution on the oceans. We mentioned acidification, but of course it's warming and loss of coral reefs and species and so on. So it's a, it's a raising awareness, and the repeated message is no new fossil fuel infrastructure. So I was going to see if we could close with a heartbeat, and then I'm going to ask people to introduce them to two people that they don't already know. So we'll, I'll do a heartbeat together.